Fantastic. So I would like to welcome you to my little presentation about lift controllers and virtual devices. Let me introduce ourselves a bit. I'm uh, working here at the Tor Engineering Company as the senior software developer engineer. Have started my career back in the days at our competitor, Burns and Partner, and it was basically always the same topic. It was about writing lift applications. And um, Can Open has started for me back in the days 2002 as a demand to be able to uh, interoperate with components, other manufacturers. And this is actually where I would like to start the presentation. The application profile for lifts, the 417, was mainly designed by and for the medium sized lift elevator industry. It was not driven by the big companies, it was mainly the smaller ones that needed to agree to a standard. In order to deliver a complete lift system, the companies involved had to strive for standard interfaces. What is an in-house problem usually for bigger corporations is for uh, smaller combination, uh, companies, a task that is spread across companies. So if you look at the lift, we can see we have interfaces literally everywhere. We have the call processing, we have things like load measuring of the car, we have to deal with the doors and its sensors, we have to deal with a lift alarm phone, with the drive, with safety gears, we have to deal with positioning, and all those components are usually available in different, well, favors. You can have for the positioning some kind of rotary or linear encoder. And if you look at the doors, we have a very large variety of different door systems that have been developed over the years. So, with other words, we have interfaces everywhere, and we needed a solution that was covering them all. Because if you look at the history of that, we can see that the interface solutions, especially for the drive unit, did exist before. It was usually solutions that was point to point connected using something like an RS 40A5 connection for a start. But all that solution that had been agreed were just solutions for one or two units. It was never ever that an interface solution was agreed that would cover the whole system. Since the companies that usually make up an elevator often only come together on the building side, plug and play was an important point in the list. What I mean with that is when we deliver for a start the lift controller, it will meet the drive unit or the load measuring unit or the push buttons on site. That means we have to rely that everything will work from the start. The people that usually build up a lift well, you can barely hope that they are electricians. Often they are just people that assemble it together with a very low level of knowledge, often not even speaking your own language. So with other words, on site, there is usually no system integrator or no person that really has knowledge about the bus system. So uh, you can really hope that they do the installation fine. It's just a question of price cuts, of uh, using as cheapest labor as possible to build a lift. So plug and play was really important. To achieve that maximum comp compatibility, COP IDs and PDO mapping have been statically defined so that you can trust if you connect on site a load measuring unit that will send the value in kilograms on the same COP ID that you would have expected it. So it doesn't matter which brand you use for testing the one on site should behave the very same. Even for the node IDs, you will find in the paper a strong recommendation. It's not mandatory, but a recommendation that will prevent in conflicts on site. But on the other hand, we had to ensure to be very flexible in our design and production of the real physical components. So subtasks had been defined in so-called virtual devices. And as we already heard, when a virtual device is implementing by a physical unit, it's like entering into a contract. That means any included virtual device requires an interface being implemented that is created from objects in the dictionary and PDOs in the form of control and status words. That means if I define a physical device and I implement a virtual device, I basically enter a contract. I agree that I will send um, the status required and that I will react on the control word. So this gives the designer a lot of opportunities 
to combine units for a start. To give an example, an inverter unit, a drive, could also be able to measure the load or to give me a position. This is up to the designer to make that happen, but it is not a restriction that the paper would give you at any point. If you have a look at the, the network structure of a lift with the lift controller on top of it, depending on the actual brand of those physical nodes, you may, as an example, find a node mainly designed as a drive unit that well integrates load measuring as well. And to be able to create a standard for lifts, but maintain this exact flexi flexibility to create new and improved products, a system is used that abstracts the physical units from the actual logical or virtual task. We may have seen that before. Here's a very practical example of a lift controller. You can see the well-known object 6000, and you can see that the lift controller would support several virtual devices. In this case, it cares about the handling of the calls, the landing calls, and the car calls as well. It will care about the door being the door controller, not the door unit. This would be the door machine, but the door unit, the controller. So the one that controls the door, and that means that the lift controller has to send that control word. It's the same with the drive controller. If the lift controller implements the car drive controller, it agreed to send the control word and to take care about the status that the unit is sending back. Then we have that for the input and output panels. And as you can see a little detail, the virtual device number is actually in the high byte, not in the low byte of the object. There's one small exception in the standard. If you just implement a very simple device, then you may uh, skip object 6000 and put your single virtual device number in the upper 8-bit of the object 1000. An example for that is, for a start, some rotary encoders that just implement one single uh, virtual device. And instead of creating an array in object 6000, they just put that in the high byte of the object 1000. This is possible as well. You see that a couple of times in the field. If you look now at the lift controller, one of the first tasks the lift controller has to do is firing up the network. So we have a power cycle. The units all wake up, the lift controller at some point wake up. And now, well, how to start them? Because all the units you will find in pre-operational state, they will send the boot up and the pre-operational pre and will remain pre-operational until they are told to be operational. So the lift controller, in this case, and it doesn't matter if it's our brand or the brand of the uh, competition, the lift controller is usually the NMT and SDMO, SDO master at the CAN interface. And you will find in real implementations often that you have two, just for practical reasons, for wiring reasons. And I will refer in my presentation a bit to that design choice. It, it's not something that is in the standard. It's just something that uh, you will find in the field quite often that you have one CAN interface that goes down to the traveling cable from the control cabinet to the car and you usually have a secondary one for the landings. It makes termination easier and such. So don't quote me on that. I will in my presentation often refer to CAN 1 or CAN 2. So that might be different on other lift controller brands, actually. So if you look at this one, we would have CAN 1, the CAN interface, going to the traveling cable. And you will see the lift controller is connected to that. We will have the drive unit that power up the engine. And we will have on the car that's moving up and down the load measuring, some kind of displays, I.O. panels for the calls, and we'll have a positioning unit that tells us where the position of the car is. You might now argue that the positioning unit is not always on the car. There are mechanical solutions where it is basically in the shaft head and you just have a belt going down. But just as an example here, don't, don't quote me on that. This interface contains all the, what I would call private components like positioning encoder, drive unit, load measuring unit and displays. So all the units that one lift does not share with other lifts. This is uh, 
actually one reason why we often have a second CAN interface. The CAN interface with the landing calls that you can see or push from the outside. This is often used to interconnect the lift controller to each other. But usually every lift has one single CAN just for its own components, components that it doesn't share with any other controller or any other lift next to it. So that's the drive, the load measuring, displays, and the positioning. Well, on that CAN interface that I was just talking about, the one to the traveling cable, I just mentioned that we are usually NMT and SDO master there. On the secondary one, where the lifts are interconnected to each other, it may raise the question who is then there, the master. For that one, we actually use a flying master feature. This is another reason why we usually have two physically CAN buses, one private one and one to interconnect with other lifts. And that one, the secondary one, where we interconnect, this is usually the one where we feature can open flying master to define who is in charge of NMT and SDO services. But for this moment, to make it simpler and to focus on the questions we want to answer, let's focus on the can one, the one that uh, contains all the private components, basically all the components that we are now interested in. So just imagine that lift to be a single lift. Well, after firing up the energy after the power cycle, the lift controller is normally the one that sends its own boot up message. As we can here see in this example, lift controller usually being node one. Again, that's not a rule, it's just a recommendation, but it makes easier for the um, companies to design the lifts and to deliver products without being on site in kind of node ID conflict situation. So stick on that um, node ID. Uh, table that you find in the 417 paper. So here we see the lift controller firing up, send up its boot up, send up its pre-operational, and the first useful task the lift controller is doing, if it's fired up, it sends the NMT command reset communication for all nodes. This is done by the lift controller to make sure that all nodes will now respond with one NMT message and the lift controller basically collects now all the nodes it sees on the bus. So in this case, you can see one of the nodes that popping up in that moment with its boot up and pre-operation would be then node 12. In our case, it is an IO panel on the car. In real, in reality, it looks a bit different. You will see dozens of NMT state pop uh, boot up and pre-operation because basically all nodes will react on that reset communication broadcast. And now the lift controller will collect all those messages and has now a picture, a list, a kind of note list, which other nodes are on the bus. And it will take care of each of that node. This procedure ensures that every node having their own producer heartbeat activated or not will be added to the lift controller's internal list of nodes. Lift controller maintains that list of nodes for every CAN interface it has. So basically, in that moment, the lift controller is already aware of what other nodes exist without knowing what those nodes will do, what their purpose is. This list is actually usually available via the user interface. Again, the user interface may look a bit different from lift controller brand to lift controller brand, depending on what you have bought. But basically, you will always find a kind of note list, a list of other nodes that the lift controller is actually, well, seeing on the bus. And usually, you will see that those note lists will contain a bit more than just the number. It will contain the name usually taken from the 1008 object or the uh, product code from the 1018 objects or the software version from 1000A. So a couple of information that are useful for the technician later on in the field uh, if it's for troubleshooting or for other purposes. So it's always good to know which nodes you are seeing, which nodes, what names they are, have, and what firmware versions they have, which could be in real life sometimes really a helper. Well, using the NMT heartbeat protocol and catching all the boot up messages and further NMT heartbeats produced, the lift controller is well aware of all hardware nodes at the bus system being alive just the hardware nodes, not the virtual devices yet, and not the purposes of those nodes, just which hardware nodes do exist. These can open nodes implement the required sensor and actor functions of the real lift installation. And now, 
the nodes indicate via which function or virtual devices they actually do implement, usually via the object 6000 that we have heard quite a lot in the last hours. The lift controller is using the producer consumer heartbeat concept, not only uh, um, aware which nodes are installed, it's also aware and can easily monitor that all the required nodes are still communicating. So it can detect at runtime if there is a node that would drop, if there is a landing call node that would go out of order, or other components that being broken or having an interrupted connection or loose connection would stop um, operating. And then the lift controller can decide if that is a fold that renders the lift out of order or it is a fold that is just a warning for the technician that has to be fixed. But we are the producer heartbeat protocol. We only monitor the physical node. What the lift controller usually is doing additionally to that is it will supervise that the required status words sent by the virtual devices are transmitted properly. Usually, and this is a bit a design decision, usually the lift controller will set up those PDOs and even times in a way that they have been sent on every change. So let's say the drive unit would set, uh, change its status it will immediately send that PDO with a status word, but usually the lift controllers also set up an even time so that those units will send the status word regularly on a low time basis, even if it has not changed, to be able to monitor that the virtual device is still operating because producer and consumer heartbeat just gives us the information about the physical node being alive, not about the virtual device still delivering a position or the drive status. For every node that now has been detected via its boot up message in the first place, the lift controller usually will push five STO jobs into a kind of job list. Again, that might be a bit different implemented from brand to brand, but basically you will have an STO job list in your lift controller. For every node that you have seen via its boot up, you will push in five messages, five STO jobs, and this is usually reading object 1000 to verify that this is a 417 unit, reading 6000 to find out what that node is actually um, yeah, doing, and then reading some additional information like the vendor ID or the product code and at least the manufacturer software version used for that note list we have seen before, but sometimes also used to, you know, <clears throat> align some comp compatibility issues that might have popped up in real life and real field with different software versions. So those informations are always handy to have and every node that has popped up will basically send or get, no, hang on, will uh, provide that information to the lift controller by the lift controller using the SDO service to read those objects from those nodes. So at that moment, our node list has already grown. We at this point, not only know which physical nodes we have seen on the network, in that moment, we also know which functions those nodes do actually implement. When this basic SEO jobs have been executed, the existing sub-indexes of 6000 will be fetched as well in the second step. And this is now where the software of the lift controller will kind of classify those nodes. So it's a bit like putting a puzzle together with a jigsaw. So the lift controller will in that process find out, oh, we have 20 nodes. This node regarding to 6,000, this one is the drive unit, that's great. This one is the position. Okay, we can now drive and we have a position. This one is a load measuring unit. So we have overload, this is a mandatory. And this is the IOs of the cars, the armor landing uh, um, panels and stuff. And in the end, if that process has been finished, the jigsaw, the puzzle should be complete and show a complete lift installation. Otherwise, the lift controller will force start, give an error fold and say, I'm missing the IO panel on the car top, or I'm missing my positioning unit, or I'm missing my uh, drive unit. And this is the moment where you might argue that the node IDs are actually not really important for running the lift. And I can agree to that, 
but for practical reasons and for preventing node ID conflicts, it's, it's good to have a look at the paper to the node ID um, table to simply prevent the conflict on site. But for running the lift, I can agree the node ID is not so important because basically the lift controller will find out at boot up who is who on the network. And some additional objects are now usually written back to the node. So once the lift controller has qualified or classified each node, it basically knows what to do. What I try to uh, uh, um, explain is for a simple IO panel unit, usually the lift controller will just set up a proper consumer heartbeat, the 1070. For car load measuring units, the lift controller would for a start add another SDO job in order to read out what kind of physical unit the load measuring unit is using to present the car weight because it can do that in percent or kilogram. For uh, rotary encoders, the lift controller would ensure via dedicated SDO jobs for that virtual device, that encoder is well aware of the right circumference of the pulley for a start or the driving belt. The reason for that is that things, if you look at the rotary encoder, it usually has a, has a pulley and a belt that has a circumference and the encoder itself can't know that. These are parameters usually set up in the lift controller itself. So after the units have been qualified or classified by the lift controller, it will for each kind of virtual device, create a dedicated list with SDO jobs for reading or writing that are suitable for that device. So rotary encoder would get the information about the circumference of the pulley from the load measuring unit. There would be an extra SDO job to fetching the physical unit. And for simple IO panels, it's basically just the heartbeat object that will be set up by the lift controller at startup. Again, you might now argue that this could be done by a kind of system integrator in production time. And why do we do that at runtime? Well, the answer is very simple. We do not have a system integrator on site. And usually components are just swapped if they are broken and they are just taken from the shelf and put in the, uh, in the lift. And you can only hope that the technician will care about the node ID, but everything else has to be done plug and play and automatically. That's why we do all that extra workload. Well, if we have done that, if we have written the required objects to the nodes after having found out what virtual devices those nodes do actually do, we are still not ready to fire up the lift because we have to get those nodes now running in a certain order. Um, after having found out who is the positioning encoder unit, the lift controller will usually start up with putting get one an operational state because the lift controller knows that other components for a start to drive will be in need of the position unit to be operational. So with, without uh, ending up uh, like the cat hunting for its own tail, we have to start with getting the position encoder running. In the case of our lift controller, and this might be a bit of a design uh, um, decision, we usually put the positioning encoder in operation first, then any kind of smart power supply unit, then the drive unit, then the doors, the load measuring, and finally, the, let's say, less important features like the car top IOs or the display units. And I have prepared a little example here of a uh, drive unit. So this is an SDO job list that would be created after we have found out which node implements the virtual device of the drive unit. And these are the objects that the lift controller would then operate on that drive unit before it can be operational. So the lift controller would in this SDO job list push in a job for setting up the producer heartbeat, um, setting up a consumer heartbeat, usually for node one, the controller, but also a secondary consumer heartbeat for the encoder so that the drive unit would then monitor the heartbeat of the controller and the encoder, the two units it relies on. The lift controller would tell the drive the rated car load, something that the drive can't know, but the lift controller knows because someone has set up that parameter. 
and a couple of other um, objects like the positioning conversion objects, they are required because the drive will, in the end, consume the position value directly from the encoder. There's actually one advantage of Canopen lifts that the position produced by the encoder can be consumed at the very same time, not only by the, the controller, but also by the drive. That makes it able that can open lifts usually run what we call position mode without creeping. So we will have machines running at two or three meters per second and then perfectly stopping at the floor without any creeping, simply because they are able to consume the position value directly from the bus without the lift controller being in the way or in, if you have bad luck, even the bottleneck and delaying those process data. But to make the drive unit able to understand the position units, the lift controller has in that initialization fast to tell the drive unit how it will be able to calculate from the raw increments that our Terry encoder is sending to calculate millimeters from that. And because the lift controller knows the circumference of the pulley, the mechanical parameter, it will tell the drive unit uh, how to convert that. A um, couple of other objects are about minimum and maximum range. This has to do with the lowest and uppest floor. And in the end, if you have done that, if you have told the drive all the information required, we can turn the drive unit operational. Then we have a position and now we have a drive that you could use to move the car. So the last thing that the lift controller will do, and this is actually something that it will also do on other um, virtual devices uh, like the you know, load measuring unit or um, um, the power supply unit, it will set up a couple of PDO related um, parameters. As I told you before, we are usually um, wanting not only to supervise the, consumer, the heartbeat of the physical node, we also like to supervise if the status word is still there, if the virtual device is still there. Um, for a start, if you have a load measuring unit, and um, you have to render the lift out of order on an overload situation. But if you only wait that the overload is sent uh, um, as an event, if it happens, you can't really be sure that your load measuring unit is still measuring. So that's why, additionally to the um, to the heartbeat that the physical node is sending, we usually like to set up uh, the status words to be sent um, on a cyclic base, so that we can always monitor that the virtual device is still there and would, in the case of a problem, indicate it to us. Usually, the lift controller also features 1010 to store the parameters um, non-volatile. This is not required because on every boot up, we would redo the process, but just to, as a parachute, we usually do that and save the parameters if supported by the unit non-volatile. Well, now having initialized the unit, the lift controller will use its power as an MT master and turn the nodes operational using the start remote node MT command. The lift controller will proceed in the very same way with all the other units. Typically, the door would be next. Then you have the car top and the displays. But it's basically the same game, just as the SDO job list will differ depending on which virtual device the unit actually uh, implements. Finally, all nodes will have got the required information via dedicated SDO jobs. And once all the nodes have entered operational state, the lift itself, if you look at it as a system, will enter normal operation as well, being ready to wait for the passenger calls and to transport people. Of course, there are a lot of other things that could go wrong in the end. But if you look at the, at the Canopen bus, this is the moment where the lift would be a lift and not single components that are, well, not connecting to each other. Yeah, this is the moment where we leave the layer of Canopen actually and would find the elevator as a working system or in that case, several lifts that work together. There are a lot of additional features that um, are on top of the bare function of driving the car. One of the features that I personally really like is the virtual terminal interface. 
it uses MPDO, which you find very often in the lift, con with the lift controller paper. So we do a lot with MPDO in the format 17 because it's so very practical to send a PDO, which contains the multiplexer and the value at the same time. And one of the features we are using MPDO for here in the format 17 is the virtual display. You can see uh, here three text-based examples. It's all using the same principle. It's VT52. I have three, uh, I've picked up three examples where we even, uh, you know, um, seemed the user interface a bit for. But as you can see, we have three different brands. They all use the can open virtual terminal um, as we have defined in the 417 paper. It's object 6000A and 6000, uh, it's 6000A sub one and sub two actually. And you can see how easy it is to transport the basic user interface. Uh, not only the drive units are doing that, meanwhile, we have door units that are doing it as well. Transporting a simple user interface directly to the lift controller. So you can also make it possible for the technician standing on the lift controller to access things on other components like the drive or the door that are maybe vendor specific, not the directly defined in the paper, but available via your user interface, which makes it quite easy for the designer of the doors or of the drives to give the technician extra information that are probably just specific to their product, to their brand, or to their component. And uh, for that three ones, we have even seemed using the face a bit to make it easier for a technician to press the right button. Other things that are very neat in the 417 and usually um, implemented with uh, existing uh, technology is the possibility to send an emergency protocol in the case of an error and the lift controller being able to fetch the error text of that specific code via STO. This is also something that the paper has meanwhile included and making it very easy to store folds, errors or warnings in one place in the lift controller. This is all extra features, extra possibilities that can open puts on top of implementing the barefoot functionality is something that makes it easier for the technician, but also makes it easier to troubleshoot remotely, because keep in mind, everything that's available on the bus can be available in a kind of cloud solution, depending how you do that, but it is possible on using that bus system. Well, that's actually all I have on my presentation. I may a bit over time, sorry for that. But uh, yeah, that's it for now.